Affairs of the Day or du jour. Ordre émanant du gouvernement, travaux des subsides, debate on an opposition motion on corporate influence over the government in the name of Mr. Blakey. Mr. Blakey, seconded by Mr. Angus, moves that in the opinion of the House, corporate executives and their lobbyists have had too much access to and influence over the government of Canada, setting working Canadians and their families back by a en encourageant les tentatives du premier ministre de saper l'indépendance du service des poursuites pénales du Canada et l'intégrité de la primauté du droit au Canada, b. en forçant les Canadiens à payer très cher leurs médicaments sur ordonnance en bloquant l'insétération d'un régime d'assurance médicaments public et universel, c providing huge subsidies to large oil and gas companies while putting corporate interests over the protection of Canada's Pacific coastal waters in the Kinder Morgan pipeline approval process. D, motivating the Minister of Environment and Climate Change to give a handout of $12 million to a multi-billion dollar corporation owned by one of Canada's wealthiest families. E, en donnant aux banques les plus profitables de pays l'occasion d'examiner et un et deux, pardon, réviser un rapport visant à faire la lumière sur les pratiques bancaires contraires aux intérêts des consommateurs. F. En négligeant de repérer une multitude de chapitres fiscaux grâce aux, auxquels les Canadiens les plus riches évitent de payer leur juste part des services publics canadiens comme les soins de santé, les pensions et le logement, et par conséquent, comme première étape pour repérer ces manques, le gouvernement devrait agir immédiatement en vue de recouvrer les 12 millions de dollars donnés à l'Oblase et les rendestir au profit des travailleurs canadiens et de leurs familles. Debate. The Honorable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, there's, there's been a, f a fair bit of outrage across the country lately at examples of major corporations getting special treatment by this government. We think, of course, of the many, many weeks of the SNC-Lavalin saga where the government stands accused of having interfered in what should be Canada's independent legal system on behalf of one particular corporation in an attempt to uh, not have them face criminal charges for, for, uh, for uh, alleged bribery internationally. Uh, but also, so that's an example of, of a big ask by a corporation. They asked the government uh, to pass whole new legislation in order to create an exit ramp for them out of the criminal charges. And we saw the entire artifice of government jump to the pump, if you will, Mr. Speaker, to try and get it done. And when some people in government stood up to that and said no, that they thought it was wrong, they were shown the door. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the case of a very big ask. And we saw just how willing the government was willing was in order to try and make that happen for a large corporation. On the other end of the spectrum, you had what appeared to be a relatively small ask. $12 million for Loblaws. But the thing about Loblaws is, is that it's one of the biggest, most profitable corporations in the country. And so you've got one of Canada's billionaires with one of the most profitable companies coming cap in hand to government asking for $12 million to help upgrade his uh, fridges and government all too happy to say yes, not, you know what, actually we think that $12 million could be better used in order to leverage new investment from companies that don't already have the capital to green their infrastructure and to green their operations. And so we want to make sure that public dollars are spent in the most efficient possible way to help those who otherwise wouldn't have any investment at all and who wouldn't otherwise be reducing their emissions at all. Instead, the government was quick to say, geez, that sounds like a great announcement that's going over there at Loblaws. What's it going to cost us to get at the podium? How do we get a piece of that action? How can we be part of a good news story that's happening already? That's not the way that you fight climate change. That's the way you might fight an election, but it's not the way you fight climate change, Mr. Speaker. And that was an example of just how prepared the Liberals are to accede to demands by corporate Canada, no matter how small. So the big asks 
get the yes, the small s get the yes, and it seems that everything in between gets a yes too. And so the question is, what will it take? At what point, what's the threshold for this government to say, you know, sometimes the interests of large corporations, and I don't think this is going to come as an epiphany to anybody listening at home, but I think it may come, given their behavior, as an epiphany to some members on the government bench, sometimes the interests of large corporations are not in line with the interests of everyday working Canadians. That happens, but you wouldn't know it to look at the activity of this government, because when big companies come with an ask for this government, the answer is yes, and they know it's going to be a yes, more and more and more, and that's why the asks are getting more and more outrageous, right down to a $12 million ask to, uh, to supplement what Loblaws was already doing in order to upgrade and green its infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. So that's where that sense of outrage comes from. And what our motion today is trying to do is to name the elephant in Ottawa, which is that corporate influence, and to draw what we believe is the very direct line between the influence that those big corporations have here in Ottawa and with this government and governments of the past in Ottawa and the pocketbooks of Canadians and the effects that this kind of friendly relationship between the Canadian government and corporate lobbyists has on the quality of life of everyday Canadians across the country, Mr. Speaker. To put that sense of outrage in context, it's because these big corporate asks and acquiescences by government are coming at a time where almost half of Canadians are within $200 of not being able to pay their bills and having to declare insolvency at the end of the month, Mr. Speaker. That's a real hardship. It's a hardship, of course, for those who have uh, some kind of event in their life, whether it's loss of employment, a serious health issue, or those other things that, that, that mean that they may not be able to report to work every day and, and make that extra $200 and end up being in financial catastrophe and declaring bankruptcy. But it's also a real issue for those who are living with the stress and the anxiety of knowing that if something takes a wrong turn, if something doesn't go quite right, that they could end up there as well. And even if that doesn't happen to them, it may happen to their neighbor, it may happen to their friends, it may happen to their family, and they have to live with the stress of knowing that it, that it may happen to them. And so. What we believe in the NDP is that the goal of government activity and government policy should be to try and bring people who are facing all these common challenges together. The common challenge of you know, finding reasonably uh, affordable childcare close to home. The challenge of ensuring that everybody who's retiring from work has an adequate pension income to continue to live with dignity after their working years. The common challenge of getting good access to health care services in their, in their community. In my community right now, the big battle is over the Concordia emergency room and making sure that the Conservative government doesn't close it, as they have promised to do and seem hell-bent on doing this June, Mr. Speaker, which means no 24-7 access to the health care system for the entirety of Northeast Winnipeg at close to home in their community. But for Canadians across the country, it's issues like the high cost of prescription drugs because we know in Canada that Canadians pay among the highest costs for prescription drugs. Our approach is to say, how do we bring people together who are facing those common challenges, and the job of government is to implement solutions that bring those costs down and make life easier for Canadians by facing our challenges together. It's not to hobnob with corporate lobbyists at receptions in Ottawa and then change the law for their benefit. It's not to let them off the hook for their big tax bills that aren't measured in the thousands of dollars or the tens of thousands of dollars, but in the tens of millions of dollars and the hundreds of millions of dollars. And when we talk about the tax havens that they use to hide their money so that they don't have to pay their fair share, Mr. Speaker, we're talking about the tens of billions mm -hmm. of dollars. It's not the job of government to look out for those guys and their interests. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're here today to say is that that's been going on for far too long, and it's time that Canadians got to see this place act in their interests. Mm -hmm. here, here. And it's in that context that Canadians are rightly angry when they hear about stories, whether it's the big story, like the SNC-Lavalin story, or the smaller amount of money, like the money that was given to Loblaws to repair their fridges. But that's a symbol, Mr. Speaker. It's not, it's not just the amount of money, it's the symbol of the government just never really willing, being willing to say no when corporate Canada 
comes asking. We've seen this too when it comes to our, you know, what should be Canada's effort to tackle climate change and to reduce our carbon footprint. Corporate interests once again get in the way of that. So much so, Mr. Speaker, that this government decided to spend over $4 billion of Canadians' money not to buy a new pipeline, not to build a new pipeline, but to buy an existing pipeline. Mm -hmm. Just as a thank you gift to Kinder Morgan for having come and tried, but couldn't get it done. And geez, we, you know, thanks for trying. We're going to give you a billions of dollars of taxpayers' money that could be invested in these other priorities. They could provide not only job training for workers in the energy sector, to help their skills align better with the new energy economy that is already underway and already developing, but also to invest in new infrastructure projects that are going to create more of those kinds of jobs, create more opportunity for on-the-job training in that new sector and that new economy, Mr. Speaker. But we didn't see that and we didn't get that. Instead, what we've seen is a government that was silent and hasn't done anything for workers like those at Stelco and Sears who when their company went bankrupt, lost their, lost their pension income. Workers still don't have protection to prevent that from happening again. Not only did this government do nothing for them except remind them that they could apply for EI, it hasn't done anything for the workers of the future to head off the problem we know is coming because of the sorry example of Sears workers and Stelco workers who didn't have a government that came to their defense exactly. and who didn't put laws on the books to protect them a long time ago when we knew these kinds of things would be happening and the NEP was proposing that we protect workers' pensions. It's a government that turned their back on GM workers in an award-winning plant known for its productivity when GM said, we're closing the doors, we're moving the plant out of Canada. Once again, the Liberals were there to remind them that they too could apply for employment insurance as if that was something they didn't already know or as if that was all they expected from their government. This is a government that didn't require via a, a publicly owned corporation to have a Canadian content requirement when sourcing a renewal of its railcar fleet. That should have been a requirement because where, the, where, because where public funds are being used at that level of investment, we should be ensuring that Canadians are getting a piece of the action and that we're creating employment in Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this government hasn't only favored corporate interests over the interests of ordinary Canadians by doing nothing, and there's been a lot of that, they've gone out of their way, Mr. Speaker, to help corporate interests when, when they conflict with the interests of everyday Canadians and working Canadians. One of the first real acts of this government was to change the law for Air Canada to make it easier for them to outsource their aircraft maintenance work. And that was a shame. It was a shame particularly in light of Liberals protesting with those same workers before the election, saying that the previous government should apply the law. Well, I suppose they're applying the law because they changed it. They actually changed the law to make it easy for Air Canada to outsource, or outsource its work, and now they're applying the law because the law doesn't actually protect workers. They've signed trade deals that were negotiated by Conservatives, that are applauded by Conservatives, that enshrine and give the protection, the real protection of law to corporate rights, but pay lip service only to the rights of workers and, and the environment. When Canada Post, another crown, co crown corporation, was in a conflict with its workers in the fall, mm -hmm. instead of changing the management, instead of giving them a direction to bargain in good faith, this government passed back to work legislation and rewarded the intransigence of Canada Post management instead of standing up for those workers, Mr. Speaker. Subsidies to large oil and gas companies continue, even though we know that we have to transition to a green economy and that money could be used to retrain workers from the energy sector and invest in projects like, the, like what the NEP has announced we want to do, which is to, which is to retrofit every home in Canada, improve their, Im, 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 improve their efficiency, not just to reduce our carbon footprint, but also to reduce the monthly heating costs of Canadians. And that money could be used for a fund to do that, to help Canadians in the pocketbook and also reduce our carbon footprint. And instead, it's going to the largest oil and gas producers in the country whose production continues to go up while royalty revenue goes down and, and the effects of climate change manifest ever more seriously and urgently, Mr. Speaker. Promises by the Liberals about eliminating tax, loophole, eliminating tax loopholes and tax havens have been ignored. 
And that's all revenue that can go, whether it's to a just transition to a greener future, Mr. Speaker, whether it's to lowering the cost of prescription drugs, whether it's building more affordable housing. That revenue isn't just, it's, it's not just innocent that that money goes away. It, it's not that that doesn't have an impact on Canadians. The fact that we don't see it doesn't mean it's not having an impact. When you compare it to what we could be doing if that money were here and those people were paying their fair share as they should, Canadians are seriously losing out. Internet giants are another example, Mr. Speaker, where they're competing with Canadian businesses who are paying their taxes, but they don't actually have to pay any themselves. And that comes at a real cost to Canadians. All these things are a kind of continuation of, of an approach we saw under the last Conservative government, which was to deregulate, to privatize, and to give major corporate tax cuts, presumably to invest in the economy. But even the late Jim Flaherty said at the time, that money was supposed to be invested back into the economy, mm -hmm. and it's not. And, and you ought to be doing that, he said to Corporate Canada. But that's a, nice, that's a nice thing to say, but he didn't compel it. He didn't raise the corporate tax rate back up because they were keeping it for themselves and their investors and their, and their executives instead, he just let them have the money. That money still sits uh, either in bank accounts in Canada or bank accounts across the world where those executives and investors pay less tax, Mr. Speaker. So when you see the lengths to which the government goes to get SNC-Lavalin off the hook, that was the big ask, Mr. Speaker, and even what they're willing to do on the smaller things, you can start to understand the sense of outrage, Mr. Speaker. Alors c'est ça notre, notre, notre motion aujourd'hui, Monsieur le Président, c'est de nommer l'influence des corporations ici à Ottawa et de mettre en, en évidence l'effet concret et réel que ça a sur les Canadiens et Canadiennes qui euh, travaillent à chaque jour, qui ont des concerns avec le coût de leurs euh, leur médicaments, qui ont des concerns euh, avec le coût de leur logement, Qui, qui veut euh, se lutter contre euh, le changement climatique, mais voit un gouvernement qui fait des promesses, mais une fois que ces promesses sont en conflit avec les, les, les intérêts des grandes corporations, ne veut pas procéder, et va pas procéder, et n'a pas procédé avec les euh, promesses et les mesures qui, qui pourraient faire en sorte que nous battons le, ou, ou luttons le changement climatique et euh, baisser les prix des, des médicaments ou protéger nos industries, cult, euh, cult, nos, nos industries culturelles parce que nous avons besoin de, euh, de se mettre debout contre des grandes corporations comme Netflix, par exemple, pour dire qu'ils doivent payer leur, euh, leur, euh, leur euh, taxe et leur, et, leur, et leur propre part pour appuyer nos industries, nos industries culturelles, Monsieur le Président. So, these are the issues, Mr. Speaker. You know, and, and, I, and I've heard, you know, there's a lot of frustration around the SNC-Lavalin affair, and people say, okay, well, you know, we've talked about this a lot. I think something wrong has happened here, but I'm not sure the way forward. I'm concerned about a lot of other issues. So how does this all tie together? Well, Mr. Speaker, I think people should care about that issue, not just because it appears that the rule of law is being undermined uh, here in Canada, and that has a lot of um, long-standing consequences, but for the reasons that I mentioned, that Canadians who are looking for income security in retirement should be concerned about the fact that this government has done nothing to legislate against the kind of pension theft that we've seen in the case of Sears workers. Mm -hmm. They just haven't done it, Mr. Speaker. They've talked about it in their budget, but it doesn't get in the budget bill the way the Deferred Prosecution Agreement clauses got in the budget bill. Mm -hmm. Let's see the pension theft provisions put in the budget bill. Hair, hair. Then we'll know they're serious. Hair, hair. But they don't do that because when it comes to workers, it's lip service, and when it comes to corporations, it's real tangible action. And you can see it in the news. You can see it in this House. Mm -hmm. You can see it in the behavior of the government. A finance minister who comes right out of the retirement benefits industry introduced legislation in this House, Bill C-27, yep. that is an attack on Canadians' pensions. I mean, there, it's not even a degree of separation where the government is responding to corporate lobbying. There, you have the corporate lobbyists in government 
doing the job of his industry from the seat of the finance minister, Mr. Speaker. That's how closely tied this government is to the corporate lobby. We haven't seen that action when it comes to pay equity. We know pay equity will come at a cost to Canadian companies, rightly so, because that is the, that's the money that Canadian women have been going to work and earning for decades, and they deserve to be paid. Here, but we've here. seen this government drag its feet. It didn't drag its feet when it came to DPAs. It didn't drag its feet when Galen Weston came knocking for $12 million to replace his fit fridges, but we have watched them drag their feet for three years on pay equity. And Canadian women deserve to get paid for the work that they're doing. Here, here. Early. Where's the action on that? Where's time allocation on that? Where's that in the omnibus budget bill, Mr. Speaker? And it isn't there. And when you look at their budget, you don't have the money for implementation there either. You've got a pittance in the budget for just beginning to do some consultative work on how to implement pay equity. It's about the same that Galen Weston got for his fridges this year, Mr. Speaker. When we talk about pharmacare and the importance of reducing the cost of prescription drugs for Canadians, study after study yep. after study after study has said that the best way to do that is to have one universal publicly administered plan that covers everybody yep. from coast to coast to coast, no matter where you live, no matter how much money you make. And what we hear from these Liberals all the time are hints that what they're going to come out with, what they're really proposing is a plan not to protect Canadians against the high cost of prescription drugs, but a plan to protect the pharmaceutical industry and the insurance industry's profits from a policy that would actually see an expansion of service to Canadians while reducing the cost overall of prescription drugs. We already spend the money it would cost to have a proper pharmacare plan. In fact, we spend more than that. What, what the NEP is proposing is that we spend less and cover more people, and we know this is possible, Mr. Speaker. The call to action in this motion is for the government to go and get that $12 million back and invest it concretely in some of the ways I've suggested today that will actually have a real benefit to working families. And you know, $12 million over the entire federal budget may not sound like a lot, but it's a symbol, Mr. Speaker. It's an important symbol of the government finally finding the spine to say no to corporate interests and put the interests of regular, everyday working Canadians first because we're waiting for them to do it. They haven't done it yet. This is the smallest possible start to that that they could have, Mr. Speaker. So let's get started and keep going. Thank you very much. Here, here. Hey, hey. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for St. Catharines. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank uh, the Honourable Member for his, uh, for his speech and his passion uh, on these subjects. Um, it's interesting in the motion, in his speech, he, he lives, leaves out the equivalent of 50,000 cars, um, the carbon equivalent of that being removed off the road, but, but I'll leave that for now. Um, and he condemns uh, corporate, or excuse me, government providing money to corporations. I was wondering if he could stand in this House today and condemn the government, the, B, the NDP government in British Columbia, for the tax credit they're giving to LNG companies to um, uh, develop their resources. It's the largest polluter in BC. Is he going to condemn that or just what Liberal governments do? Is When NDP governments do it, it's okay. Thank you so much. Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Well, um, Sorry, there's another debate happening in the chamber, Mr. Speaker. I was listening with rapt attention. Uh, but I would like to answer the uh, member's question. He said that I'm opposed to the government working with corporations to reduce greenhouse gas uh, emissions. That's not actually true, Mr. Speaker. There is a room for corporate partnership. It's just that the threshold has to be that public funds are actually leveraging new investment. It can't be that they see a company like Loblaws, which is investing $36 million of its own dollars, which is appropriate, and which they were doing anyway to renovate their fridges. But the impression you get, Mr. Speaker, is not out of a government looking for real investment opportunities to say, how do we further reduce Canada's greenhouse gas emissions? How do we leverage investment from the private sector? Instead, you get the impression of a government that's looking around saying, who's already doing some of this work? And how do we get to the podium? How, what's the cost of buying our way into announcements that are happening anyway? And they're happy to spend the money because it's not their money, it's Canadians' money, and they're, and they're roaming around buying their place at a podium of things that are happening anyway, rather than leveraging new investment that will actually create new reductions in carbon emissions, Mr. Speaker. 
Questions and comments? Honorable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Thank you. Speaker, I thank my colleague for his speech. Certainly, we in the Conservative Caucus share many of the criticisms of corporate welfare. We feel that when Canadians pay taxes, first of all, their taxes should be lower. Secondly, when they pay taxes to the government, they expect that those taxes to be used for vital services, not for things like buying fridges for already well-off company. I think maybe an area where we disagree, though, is the importance of policies that facilitate competitiveness. The, the NDP approach, as we heard it outlined in the speech, generally emphasized more regulations as a tool to keep jobs in Canada. Uh, does the member agree that we, we do need to be attentive, if, we, if the goal is creating jobs in Canada, to the competitiveness of the Canadian business environment and measures like, uh, like lowering business taxes, uh, like ensuring a fair processes for small business, counteracting the attack on small business that we saw from this government. Uh, those things are very important for facilitating employment uh, because they make it easier for people to invest, grow and create jobs here in Canada. Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Yeah, I mean what I would say is that the NEP is sensitive to concerns of, of, of competitiveness but the question is how do, how, do you, how do you measure those things and how do you define those things? And so what we saw with the previous government that, of which the member was a supporter uh, was that the answer was always another tax cut, more deregulation, more privatization of services. It's a theme. I mean, we're seeing it in Manitoba under a conservative government. We see it in Ontario under a conservative government. Where conservative governments have been, that's what you see. You see corporate, big corporate tax cuts, you see deregulation, and you see privatization. That's not a way to protect the interests of Canadians. So yes, when you're making policy and when you're devising regulation, competitiveness has to be one of the concerns. But you can't just ask corporate Canada to go out and regulate itself and expect that you're going to get optimal outcomes for Canadians. That's just not the way it works. And where you have, I was at a, I was at a presentation for the day of mourning in uh, Winnipeg just on uh, Friday, Mr. Speaker, and we were hearing about the early days of bringing in a Factories Act to Manitoba, and you heard many of the same arguments then. You can't, you can't have a six-hour, you can't have a six-day work week. That would hurt competitiveness, and uh, you know, uh, you can't have kids. The, you can't ban kids under 16 from working because we won't be competitive with other jurisdictions where we do this. Uh, progress didn't get made by ceding to those companies the ground. Progress was made by making rules that were fair, that considered competitiveness as an important consideration, but not the only one, implementing and enforcing those regulations, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the uh, New Democratic Party for the opposition motion today, but I, I'm hoping for something that probably isn't possible, Mr. Speaker, that is, if we could take some of the partisanship out of this motion and look at it as a deeply generic problem of every government in this country, provincial and federal, regardless of who is in the PMO, that corporate lobbies have too much influence. Uh, there's an excellent book uh, by the former leader of the Alberta Liberal Party. His name is Kevin Taft, and his book is called Oil's Deep State, in which he chronicles how it was that even with the change of government in Alberta, the control over p government policy, and particularly energy policy, was deeply held by big oil. And he, he, the term is used by academics a lot, the problem of captive regulators. So I would say that the National Energy Board is captive to the industry they regulate. And so is Health Canada, quite captive to big pharma. You could go issue by issue, department by department. So I'd like to ask my honorable colleague if he thinks we could elevate this debate by looking at the problem generically and not targeting just one party, because I would put to you that it's endemic. Member for Elmwood Transcona. What I would say is, I think, and I think the point that the Honourable Member is raising that I'm sympathetic to is that power doesn't just reside in the halls of government. The power of, of capital, the, the power of people with money is very real. It's real power. The power of people who employ other people is real power as well. And so any government of the day only has its hands on the levers of so much power. But the question, and what I'm trying to get to by noticing a pattern of behavior in this government, just as there was a pattern of behavior in the previous government, and there have only been two parties ever in power in Canada, is that uh, when it comes to those levers, those levers of power that you can get democratically through elections and, and democratically elected governments are just some of them, which is why it's so important that you have people who control those levers that are there to fight 
for the right causes and to fight for the interests of everyday Canadians instead of acquiescing to the demands of corporate Canada. And, and there's no guarantee of success in those things because not all the power resides here. So I do take the point, but I think if we want to talk about how we fix that problem, surely part of that, and I imagine that's why the Honourable Member has decided to run for politics as well, is to replace people who are too beholden to those interests and don't see the conflict of interest between uh, corporate Canada's interests sometimes and the interests of everyday working Canadians. And that's the other point that I think is very important to address in this debate, so I don't, I don't apologize for spending time on it, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Sure, I listen with great interest. And, you know, part of the whole issue with them giving $12 million to Galen Weston's fridges is they thought this was a great idea that would inspire Canadians on climate change. When you think of the huge crisis we're facing, you think of the massive subsidies they give to oil and gas, they thought they could change the channel on the SNC scandal by doing a press conference announcing giving $12 million to not just one of the richest men in Canada, but a guy who lives in a gated community in Florida and fought against a basic living wage for his own employees. I'd like to ask my honorable colleague what it suggests about the complete disconnect of this prime minister, who's very much become like a head butler for the uber rich instead of a defender of working class Canadians. Well, member for Elma Transcona. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleague for the question. And I, I mean, I do think this was a bit of an attempt to try and change the channel, to stop talking about SNC-Lavalin and start talking about I get Loblaws replacing its fridges, because they were desperate to talk about anything else. Um, and it, it's, I, I don't think it was successful, and I think it, it spurred a similar sense of outrage because of the theme that we're talking about, because that announcement comes just as much as the SNC-Lavalin controversy out of the same problem, which is that when big corporate companies come asking in Ottawa, and particularly to this government, they get what they ask for. And so it's a species of the same problem. We didn't actually get away from one of the central problems of the SNC-Lavalin affair. They just continued right on that track. And that's part of the problem is that they don't see that. I mean, I think for them, um, they don't, they're not making the connection between the nice, you know, the, the corporate lobbyists who are paid to be nice guys and come here, wine and dine, go to their fundraisers, uh, wine and dine them at receptions on the hill here, and they think it's nice to be friends with those people, and, and they know people, and so it's cool to know people who know people, but they're not making the connection between what those corporate lobbyists are asking them to do and how that affects the pocketbooks of Canadians, how that affects Canadians' ability to get an affordable place to live, how that affects the price of their prescription drugs, how that affects them when we see the effects of climate change and we know that Canada surely is not doing enough to fight it because we still have Stephen Harper's old targets and we're not even on track to meet them. And that's what we're trying to do today is to make that connection between that corporate culture and the real effects that it's having for everyday Canadians. 